Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you had a good weekend and you're ready, ready to jump back to HCI. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Just type yes in chat if you can hear me, so I know I'm... Okay, great. Thanks very much. Okay, um, before I get started, um, I, uh, we're going to have a very brief presentation by uh, Mia Dillon, who's going to uh, exhort us to go vote. So, Mia, you can go ahead and unmute your microphone there, and uh, the floor is all yours. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, like Professor Blongard said, my name is Mia. Um, I'm a member of UVM Votes which is a student-led coalition we started this year when we noticed that there's significant differences in voter turnout depending on major. Um, voter turnout at UVM is already very low um, at around 40%, but in the SEMS and business school, it hits like more like 30. Um, so we are trying to make it easy, as easy as possible for kids to vote. Um, if you email me, I'll work with you on a case-by-case -case basis, figuring out whatever voter suppression laws your state from home may throw at you. Um, and as a last resort, you can always vote in Vermont. You can register up until Election Day, November 3rd. So please shoot me an email if you have any questions about this. Um, I would love to help you. Uh, my email, I'll put it in the chat after this, as well as our website. And second of all, if you're unsure if you are registered, just hop on vote.org and you can figure out if you are within two minutes. So yeah, that's it, go vote. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mia. Um, I'd like everyone to unmute their microphone and please give a round of applause for Mia. Um, <laughs> Mia is obviously a student as well. She is, uh, she is just as busy as you are and she has taken on this very important role. Uh, so please, uh, show her some respect by uh, by going and vote. So please connect with Mia. Mia, please type your email or any other contact details into into chat for our students. Thank you. So much for having me. Okay. Chat. Thank you. Okay. So uh, back to uh, HCI. Uh, hopefully, most of you finished uh, Deliverable Five. And as you probably know, because it's fresh in your memory, right at the end of Deliverable 5, you're submitting the normal uh, videos, but you're also uploading two data files, one that contains some training data for the first of your two digits, and another training data, uh, another data set that contains data about uh, your second digit. Any quick questions or confusion about Deliverable 5? What you're uploading? Any questions before we move on to deliverable six? So far, so good. Okay, so uh, let's have a very quick look at uh, let's have a quick, very quick look at uh, deliverable six. Uh, this is up and, and viewable now uh, on Blackboard. Uh, you're going to be doing three basic things in deliverable uh, uh, in deliverable six. The first thing is you're gonna be capturing data live and doing testing, or your KNN is gonna be predicting uh, class labels as data comes in live from the Leap Motion device. You're not gonna be using canned data for KNN testing as you did uh, in Deliverable 5. As you will see, uh, when you start to hover your hand uh, over the device, your KNN will be accurate but not perfect. Here is uh, my KNN early on in deliverable uh, six, and my two digits are two and four. And if you look at the console, you'll see the right-hand column of numbers in the console is the KNN's prediction. There it's predicting two, four, two, four, uh, and so on. Maybe a little hard to see in this video, but it is not doing a, a perfect job uh, of prediction, which is not surprising at this point uh, in time. So what you're going to be doing in step two is uh, cleaning up the data a little bit, so making it easier for KNN to predict the correct uh, class uh, label. And then in the third and final step, you're going to be gradually folding in data from other students in the class to your KNN to train on and to uh, predict on. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about step three for a moment. This takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, 
what you will uh, what you will see is when you get to the third step when you get to the third step is you'll be pointed to this Google uh, folder which at the moment contains 10 digits from me and two digits uh, from Amanda. Uh, if, you, if you start it on a uh, deliverable six right now, uh, and if you, get to, uh, if you get to this step, there won't be much data for you. Amanda and I will try and grade a deliverable five uh, by the end of this week, maybe hopefully by Thursday. So if you get to this point by Thursday, you should see that this is filled with um, uh, data from at least 61 uh, of you. Okay. So, um, so if you get here early and there's not enough data, just, just hang out until Thursday. We will populate this Google folder. Okay. <coughs> Once you start to fold in data from other students, you're going to be posting the prediction accuracy of your KNN algorithm uh, incrementally as you add data from the other students. So in my case, as mentioned, I had uh, digits two and four. Uh, at this point, my algorithm, is, my KNN algorithm is excellent at telling whether I'm signing two or four. Um, distinguishing between two and four is also pretty easy, as you can tell by the gesture. Uh, and now I've forgotten what this is. Six and seven, not so easy, a little bit, a little bit trickier. Okay, so uh, I then added a third digit, uh, which was zero, and you can see my KNN algorithm is still doing a good job at predicting all three digits, but when I add the fourth digit, which for me was one, this algorithm, my KNN could not distinguish between zero uh, and one. You'll notice that in uh, Amanda's case here, Amanda started with digits four and five, and her KNN was doing perfectly fine at distinguishing between four and five. Uh, Amanda then added in one, and her KNN also had a hard time with one. So you'll notice there's a bit of a pattern here, as Amanda and I added in our fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth digits. You'll see for both Amanda and I, our KNNs were doing pretty well for all nine digits, except the digit one. I think this is just a coincidence, but maybe there's something about um, the digit one, the digit one compared to some of the other digits that's hard for KNN to distinguish between. I'm not sure. When uh, you all get to the end of deliverable six, this entire table will be filled out and we'll see whether there are particular digits that are difficult uh, to sign. And we'll get a sense of which parts of this combined data set we're constructing together has weak spots in it. At the end of deliverable six, we are not expecting that you have a KNN that is doing uh, perfect on all 10 digits. What we do want you to show us at the end of deliverable six is where the weaknesses in your KNN is, if there are any weaknesses. In Amanda's, in my case, it's digit one. You may possibly be able to post a KNN that does perfectly fine on all 10 digits or has a particularly hard time with one digit or two digits or three or five or seven, doesn't matter. In deliverable seven, next week, we're gonna clean and uh, we're gonna clean the data and work on improving your KNN so that it can do uh, better than 50% on all 10 digits. Meaning if, if the user signs any one of the 10 ASL digits, your KNN will get that digit correct more than half the time. That's the bar that you have to get over in deliverable seven. So that's where we're headed. Okay. Any questions about that? Big picture stuff about deliverable six. As usual, it is due next Monday night at 11.59. All good? Okay, so uh, back to lecture then. Um, we are going to finish our segment today on uh, interactive systems uh, design. Uh, unique design approaches to interactive systems. What is it about HCI that requires different approaches to design than design approaches that you might find in software engineering or engineering or architecture, other, other domains? We'll finish that discussion today. And then, uh, and then starting on Thursday, we're gonna switch gears and not look at interactive systems, we're gonna look at humans. And obviously cognitive psychology uh, is a course in and of itself. It's a whole multi-year study. 
So we are going to have a very short series of four lectures, a crash course on cognitive psychology. We're going to pick and choose what aspects of uh, human psychology are relevant for HCI. And we're going to look at four different aspects of psychology. How our brains build mental models of the world out there or the interactive system that I'm interacting with. We'll look at memory, attention, and perception, which are obviously relevant to designing uh, interactive technologies. We'll, we'll dig down into perception a little bit more in lecture 12, and we'll finish in lecture 13 with the discussion of, of affect, which is the psychology's word for emotion. So what is the role of emotions in interactive uh, systems? Okay, so back to uh, lecture eight. This was our discussion on the design process itself, the path going from an, a set of identified human needs to a finished uh, product. As we saw uh, last time, most design processes that you'll find in HCI, if you go and work uh, in industry, is it has this sort of star pattern where there are lots of different activities that make up the design process, but they all feed into the central activity of evaluation. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about evaluation uh, in, in this lecture eight. Okay, before we get to evaluation, however, we talked about scenarios before. Um, we started to talk about prototyping, and the idea in prototyping was to try and create these very cheap uh, prototypes, which might just be uh, sketching something on a piece of paper and presenting different pieces of paper to the user. If it's a physical device, it might be a cardboard mock-up. Um, very, very simple processes. We talked about Wizard of Oz prototypes, so starting now to, to flesh out some of the code, the web pages, or what the user is going to see on the screen. When they click on buttons on that screen, the developer sends back the results uh, of, the, of what the user should get back from that clicked button because we haven't written the script or the code to implement the functionality hidden behind that button. Uh, we talked a little bit about script-driven prototypes. This was, used to be popular a few years back, but some of you might come, come up against visual programming languages like Visual Basic or Macromedia Director or Flash uh, in, uh, in industry. It's still, uh, there's still systems out there for that. And then finally, of course, this idea of the full system uh, as a whole difficult to storyboard systems that aren't discrete pages uh, that aren't discrete pages like like in a website a lot of interactive systems including your ASL educational game is continuous there is a continuous feed of data coming in from the device and continuous action being performed by the user there aren't these there there aren't these clearly defined discrete events leading from one activity to the next. So at the end of week 10, when you start to develop your educational game, how are you going to go about storyboarding this continuous process and shape it into an engaging experience, an enjoyable experience that leads to the user learning all 10 ASL digits? Okay. All right, as promised, uh, we're going to spend the rest of this lecture talking about evaluation. We are not going to talk about requirements. This is covered in depth in the sister class to this, software engineering. How do we go from identified human needs to writing down functional requirements? What the system should and shouldn't do. The system should teach the user digit zero, then digit one. Then the system should teach them zero be, to be able to alternate between zero and one, and so on. Those are functional requirements. We're going to focus on in this class evaluating non-functional requirements. How engaging, how accessible, how acceptable, how usable is the system? We're not going to talk more about physical design and conceptual design. We talked about conceptual design when we talked about packed analysis. Who is involved? What are they doing? And what is the physical, social uh, context that surrounds those activities? Physical design is mostly for uh, hardware technology, so uh, ergonomics, uh, rapid prototyping of physical objects, and so on. I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, so evaluation. How do we go about evaluating a final system? How do we go about evaluating a storyboard, a scenario? It's not immediately obvious. 
a design philosophy that you'll find in HCI is this concept of evaluating early, often, and everything. Clearly, we would like uh, not to wait until we have a final product to test it with our users, but that raises a challenge. How do you go about evaluating some of these very early stages of the interactive system? Uh, how do you perform evaluation during these early stages of design? Okay. Key to evaluation, regardless of what we are evaluating, the final system, a storyboard, a set of non-functional requirements, a conceptual design, is measurement. As you'll see as we go along here in evaluation, we are trying to distill down user testing, where users are interacting with a piece of paper, or a final system, or a cardboard box. We're trying to distill down those interactions into numbers. We then take those numbers and analyze whether what those numbers tell us about whether we're satisfying the requirements and are we satisfying, are we satisfying user needs? Are we satisfying the non-functional requirements? It's important to remember in interactive systems uh, design that typically user need takes precedence over requirements. So if these are ever in uh, antagonism with one another, so if the requirements say the user should do this, that, that, and the other, and that ends up causing the user to be very frustrated as they interact with an early prototype, instead of trying to convince the user that they shouldn't be frustrated, we should probably go back and rewrite the requirements. We should take our measurements from evaluation and use them to alter the prototype, requirements, conceptual design, and or physical design uh, as necessary. Okay, it's very easy during design to forget this process. Your user is frustrated with an early prototype of your AS educational game. You just, it's kind of a, um, an uncomfortable fact. You just sort of forget about it and carry on making your game more and more complex and interesting and so on. How do you address that frustration in your, uh, in your design process? Okay, obviously we can't uh, recruit in users all the time, so good HCI designers have a mental model, which we'll talk about uh, on Thursday, they have a good mental model of their user. What would their user think if they saw this on the screen as you're coding? Okay, so a lot of evaluation is actually informal and the developer is asking themselves, am I doing this right? And what is meant by right here? Right is, is this something that my, my users would find engaging, accessible, acceptable, uh, and so on. Okay, however, given whatever time and cost resources we have available during actual design, we should try and do formal evaluation with at least a subset of our actual user base. Okay, so how do we do formal evaluation? Well, before we start to do the evaluation, we have to design the evaluation itself. What is it we are trying to accomplish with this particular round of evaluation? You might sketch out an idea for your ASL educational game, email your sketches to a friend and ask them to write back comments on what they think. Would they want to learn ASL using this system if you coded it up? Okay, so your aim is to get early feedback on which aspects of your sketch, of your prototype, uh, your users find engaging or, or frustrating, for example. So what is being evaluated? What part of your system did you sketch out in that sketch? Why are you evaluating that part and not something else? You could be evaluating the KNN algorithm, the virtual hand, um, some, guiding, uh, some guiding images that show the user how to actually use your system. What parts of it are you testing? And who, why did you choose those people to email your prototype to? Finally, as I mentioned, measurement is going to be a very important part of evaluation, as we'll see in a, in a moment. Which metrics which did we choose? How are we going to reduce our evaluations down to numbers? Okay, if you work in industry, often um, there are experts who will work with you. So assuming you're the developer of the system, there are actual experts who will sit down and help you design an evaluation process. But that, this raises yet another question is who is an expert uh, at that? 
Okay. Once you once you start to sketch out your evaluation, you plan out user testing, and given results from the expert who is reviewing your evaluation plan, you may sharpen that method of testing, rinse and repeat. So as you can kind of see, there is there is actual there's a design process for the design of evaluation itself. Okay. Clearly, again, given, uh, given whatever financial or human resources you have available, you want to try and recruit as diverse a subset of users as possible, right? If you were to choose a random subset of students in this class to test a prototype of your system, it's possible that in that subset, if you manage to recruit three or four people, given the demographics in this class, you might end up with all males and they may all be righties. That may lead you to an overly optimistic assessment of your prototype. Okay, so combine results, analyze them, report back to the designers, and, and repeat. Okay, so uh, during this process of evaluation, as I mentioned, we're trying to measure things. We're trying to assign numbers to very vague words like visible, consistent, familiar, and so on. So here is uh, here's a reminder of the 12 design principles, things that you're usually trying to maximize in, a, in an interactive system. These 12 design principles are also good stand-ins for non-functional requirements. We have the very high-level non-functional requirements, which is engaging, uh, engagement, accessibility, acceptability, and so on. But we can unpack those into this set of 12. But how do we measure these things? How do you assign a number? If a user interacts with your system, they could tell you with words, oh, this is kind of familiar. It reminds me of this other system I was using. They could tell you that, but numbers are always better than words. So how would we assign measurements? What are the things that you might actually count during a user interaction to determine how familiar that system is to your user. So what might be a metric for familiarity? Let's pick familiarity for now. What might be a metric that you could, that you could measure during your user interaction? Where that metric should give you a higher number if the user found that system more familiar and a lower number if the user found that system less familiar. Once you have your ASL uh, game up and running, you're probably going to test it with some with your uh, flatmate or some family members. Leap Motion is probably going to be pretty unfamiliar to them. Whatever graphics you show on the screen in conjunction with the device are going to be unfamiliar to uh, to your your user. But someone might have seen Leap Motion before or played ed educational games. Somebody might have played typing games to teach themselves to type rapidly. So there might be aspects of your system that are familiar compared to other systems. How might you actually measure that interaction to know, to get a gauge for how, to get an estimate for how familiar your user finds your system? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. Okay, good one is always so speed uh, speed of re, uh, speed of interaction is always a good one. Yep, how quickly they use it that's a good one, Jillian. That might tell you something about how familiar the system is, right? If it looks or acts like systems they've used before, they should be able to use it pretty quickly. Another way to turn this around is what it would be a, a metric that would measure. Um, unfamiliarity. If they found the system very alien and didn't really understand how to use it, what might they do and how might you distill numbers out of those user actions that would measure how unfamiliar the system is?
let's try a related one. Let's take visibility. So uh, your system has a bunch of functions. Uh, let's imagine in your ASL game, um, your system allows the user to practice individual digits where they choose which digits they want to work on. They indicate they want to work on digit four and they work on four for a while. That's, that's functionality one. Functionality two is the system is going to choose which digit and it's going to flash different digits up on the screen and they're going to have to sign that digit. That's functionality two. Functionality three is a game. They're going to be digits that are falling from the top of the screen and the user has to sign those digits to blast those digits out of the sky. So user driven digits, system driven digits and a game. How would we know how visible those three functions are to the user? Let's assume the user can pick any one of those three functionalities. How would we know whether those functions were hidden from the user or not? Again, and if you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. Again, we could ask them, so as they're interacting with the system, we could ask them, how, how many different modes does this, how, how many modes does this piece of software have? but they'd have to kind of remember when they realized that there were these three different modes. How might we detect that and distill that down into numbers? Exactly. We could track how many of the modes they actually they actually use. If they use it, they obviously found it. It was visible somehow, and they knew how to unlock it or turn it on or switch to that to that mode. Let's switch that around. We could ask how um, uh, invisible some of your functions are. Which again, if we invert Nolan's metric here, we could track how long it takes someone to do something. But maybe we have a user that isn't interested in playing games. They want to focus on learning and they know that the third function is there, but they like, they know the third mode is there, the game, but they like playing the other two modes instead. So they may see it, they just may not use it. In which case, tracking how many of the modes they use may not be a sufficient metric for measuring invisibility. How hidden are some functions? Whatever, whatever smartphone you have, obviously some functions on that phone are more visible and some are more hidden than others. From the developer's point of view of your phone, how do they know how hidden it is from your point of view? What counts as a more hidden function on a phone than a more visible function? how many screens you have to go through, right? So visibility in a system is usually that, uh, as Julian uh, originally mentioned, is the speed it takes. But you can measure things other than speed. You can, mention thi you can measure things like clicks. How many clicks did it take for someone to get to a particular functionality? Remember our discussion about affordances. Affordances are uh, interactions that are advertised by an object, so a tree stump if you show a picture of a tree stump next to a picture of a chair, those two images together advertise or afford the same interaction, which is sitting. I mentioned last time in your for the ASL game, um, your user may be um, practicing the gestures, the uh, digits with their primary hand, but they can navigate a menu or pick functions in your system using their secondary hand. You're not going to be able to write anything on the screen in English. We're going to assume that your users are not, not native English speakers. They may not know English. So what would we draw on the screen to advertise that they can use their secondary hand to navigate the system? They can do this to slow the speed at which they're taught ASL digits, or they can bunch it up and bunch their secondary hand into a fist to say speed up and 
speed up the, the speed at which the system teaches them ASL. How would we show that? And you, I mean, actually, there's different ways we could show that. We could advertise that functionality. But how would we measure whether our users were able to interpret that affordance correctly or not? Doesn't have to be that affordance, it could be something else. If you project a visual metaphor onto the screen, that's projecting a particular affordance, that's suggesting there's a particular kind of interaction that's possible in the system, how will you know whether that affordance is successful or not? As Jillian mentioned, we could fall back on time. How quickly do they carry out that, that interaction that's advertised by that, that system? How often do they get it right or wrong? Here's my attempt at an affordance. What is this, what is this graphic telling you to do? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. Perhaps it's not such a great affordance. Put your finger there and swipe down. Okay, great. Um, so I did okay, but not great. That's actually not a fingerprint, that's a thumbprint. It's my thumbprint. So I could, for example, uh, on, a, on a touchscreen device, um, show this affordance and measure with something like Leap technology, which finger was pressed onto this. And as Sarah mentioned, if she understood this affordance as put your finger there and swipe counterclockwise, if uh, people put any of the five fingers on there, um, that's not so great. I can actually measure that. But if most of the time people put a thumb there, that metric will say, that number will represent that my affordance is, uh, is better. Right? So we're taking all of these vague ideas like affordance and how navigable your system is and trying them to distill down to a number where a higher number or a lower number, it doesn't really matter, a higher number represents more successful implementation of that non-functional requirement. Okay, so uh, for visibility, we already mentioned this could be speed at which they uh, unlock a function or how many uh, times they need to click through to something. If they're looking for a function and they don't know where to find it, they may fall back on trying to search for that function using the search function in your application. How many times do they call up a help page and immediately after accessing a help page, they then interact with a particular mode in your system? meaning that mode is invisible. It's hard for people to unlock it unless they go and read your help pages first. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna turn the floor over to all of you for about two minutes, and I want you to pick uh, one or two or three of these and type into chat a way that you could actually con uh, quantify one of these metrics. I've already, we've already discussed a few ideas. So I could type into chat, for example, visibility, colon, number of times help pages used. There's my proposal for a metric for measuring visibility. I could type into chat affordance, colon, uh, how often is a thumb rather than any of the five fingers touched to this particular position on the screen and rotate it. Okay, go ahead and uh, think about uh, one or two or three of these 12 non-functional requirements and how you might go about quantifying them. And if you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. Let's see what you came up with.
Okay, Oliver and Amanda have ideas about measuring a navigation. Bryce mentions feedback. So how well is uh, how much feedback is coming back from your system? Uh, percent of user actions for which the system displays a response or indication that the user has done that action. Exactly. So how many things does the user do in which this that triggers an actual response from the system? That would be a great way to measure uh, feedback. The user could clench and open their hand over your leap motion device and that may trigger no particular functionality. Okay. Uh, control. Sarah mentions control. How many times does someone deviate from an expected path? That's a great idea. How many times is a warning message flash up or a uh, asking them to, to go back. Uh, consistency, exactly. So how many times does a, uh, users, plural, Cole says, how many times do different users take the same path to the same destination? That might tell you something about consistency. Yeah. Uh, Thomas mentions how long it takes. Yeah, navigation, great. Alex mentions consistency. How long on average a user remains on each page uh, signing, okay. So if they're confused, they may hang out in the same place for a while. Uh, Sishin mentions control, number of times that users uh, to do from specific paths. I'm not quite sure I understand that one, but uh, possibly a good idea. Okay, um, when we talk about information spaces in a moment, we're going to talk about navigating through those spaces, which uh, is number five there, navigation. How often does someone reverse direction and go back again? How often do they literally or figuratively undo actions that they've just performed? How often do they make a mistake and have to have to go back again? That often tells you something about navigation, but something about uh, these other aspects as well. Um, somebody mentioned here the number of different paths people take uh, to get from, uh, oh, Oliver mentioned for navigation. How many different paths people take from a start point to an end point in your system? The more different paths they take, that might tell you something about how flexible your system is. Now that may be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on the people and activity and context uh, surrounding the interactive uh, system. Okay. So uh, these are all great ideas for metrics. E every single one of them here, um, how long, number of times, how many times, percent of user actions, those are all things that obviously can be boiled down to numbers. Once we uh, employ these metrics, and you could build these metrics into your code themselves, one of the, one of the important things about user testing is um, not starting from scratch, so you can actually build these measurements into your code, and your code can record these metrics for you during a user interaction. Assuming you do some user testing, you deploy these, your, your prototype uh, armed with these metrics and you get these numbers back. Now actually the hard part of evaluation begins, which is what do the numbers tell you about any of these 12 uh, non-functional properties of your system? And how should you alter the system to improve it? So uh, people mention time quite a few times. So if it takes people a long time to learn ASL digits on your system, that's not a specific enough metric to tell you where exactly you may need to make improvements. So let's assume we get back data from multiple users, and I've just added on some of my own metrics here. Um, and imagine uh, each of these dots here represents the average value of a given metric for uh, one user. So for example, um, let's go to visibility. I choose to assign a metric, which is the number of times that help pages were used. Um, and imagine here we get consistent, consistently low values. So low values might mean that all users consult the help pages a lot. So typically we want large values to be uh, sorry, yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, so number things to the left here are bad, things to the right are, are good. Okay, so everyone had a hard time with visibility, let's say. Everyone was consulting your help pages. That's usually a pretty strong signal about where the problem is, right? You're going to have to do something other than, you're going to have to take some of those things that were hidden and make them more visible somehow. Okay. 
Alternatively, uh, people may score very highly on one of your, your metrics. So for example, in recovery here, we're assuming that three users all scored high on your metric associated with recovery, meaning they were able to quickly recover after something went wrong or they made a mistake with your system. So your system is doing well on recovery. You can move on to improvements on other uh, aspects of your system. The hardest thing to deal with is high variance. So uh, you deploy a prototype of your ASL game, you test it with three family members, one person um, learns all 10 digits in about five minutes. Another person learns all 10 digits uh, after using your system for an hour. And the third person learns nothing about your three digits. What does that large variance tell you about your system? Or what does it tell you about that particular non-functional requirement? not clear enough for everyone. So um, let's assume that we get high variance on a metric associated with constraints. So your system may put constraints on the user to help them do whatever they're going to do. In your ASL game, you're probably not going to expose your user to all 10 digits and have them trying to learn all 10 digits at the same time. That is not a good way to learn anything. So you might apply constraints and focus them on one of the 10 digits. Once they exhibit competency with that one digit, you may expose two digits, then three, then four, and so on. But some people may handle those constraints better uh, than others. One user may, uh, may exhibit frustration that they're being forced to focus on just one digit out of 10 to begin with, and they give up on your system. It's frustrating, it's not engaging, I don't like working with it, it's unacceptable. Someone, that's this person down here, they scored low on your metric. Somebody over here scores high on constraints. It was helpful to them that they had these constraints. You might do a control study where you deploy the exact same system, but you remove constraints. You, everyone learns all 10 digits right from the beginning, and this person did much better with constraints than without. So can we be a little more specific than it's not clear enough for everyone? What does that high variance tell us about, about our system? So if Henry's right and it tells us indeed that it's not clear enough for everyone, maybe it's visibility we're talking about here, Certain functions seem invisible from one point, person's point of view, but very visible to another person's point of view. What does that tell us? How does that guide your thinking about how to improve your system for the next round of user testing? So Sarah mentions maybe we need different modes for different people. So maybe that suggests something about flexibility, right? So some people are struggling with our system and maybe our system assumes a one size fits all and we need to present our system or present different views or different functions depending on our different users. What we're talking about now is acceptability, right? Among those four high-level non-functional requirements, or sorry, sorry, accessibility. Some people have a hard time accessing the functionality in your system, which is learning ASL, and others don't have a problem. Can we be more specific? So uh, Henry mentions not for everyone, Sarah mentions for different people. Which different people? How do we know which demographic uh, how do we know which demographic is uh, at a disadvantage here and why? Think about your ASL system. Does it matter who is at a disadvantage here? Maybe the only thing that matters is that we detect high variance. Some people are having a hard time, some are not.
Children may not understand the technology as fast, so we might assume that we know what the demographic is that's disadvantaged, or we might see that children have a hard time using the system and adults don't. So we might actually take this high variance and look for distinguishing features in the demographics among those that had a hard time and those that didn't. Let's think about uh, Sarah's idea here about presenting different modes for different people. So we see high variance. Some people are having a hard time. Some people are having an easy time. We go back and look at our system and we realize in retrospect that we did design this system as a one size fits all. It's the exact same mode for everyone. Everyone is, everyone is challenged in your system to learn one digit. Once they signal competency, it'll show two digits, three digits, four digits. Or maybe it shows one digit and they work on that one digit and they work on that for five minutes. After five minutes, two digits are shown. After 10 minutes, three digits are shown. After 15 minutes, four digits are, are shown. But there are certain users that exhibit frustration with that. You might, uh, you might have done a survey and you find that uh, children versus adults, male versus female, righties versus lefties, neither of those demographic distinctions explain this high variance. Righties and lefties equally have, get frustrated with your system compared to other righties and lefties. What is the demographic split in this example that explains this high variance? Some users exhibit frustration about being forced to work on one digit for five minutes before unlocking the second digit. Who are those users? If we need different modes for different people, we need to know what those different people are to begin with then we can start to think about what modes or what variations in our interactive system might be appropriate for these different people. We might have assumed that everyone coming to the system is a complete novice with ASL, but that's probably not a realistic uh, assumption. Some people who may use your system uh, as Sarah mentions, right? Some people may already know some of the digits or they may have known them 10 years ago. They're in their head somewhere. They're just a little bit rusty. So maybe we are going to allow different modes for different people. People could click on whether they, they kind of know ASL or not. And those that signal that they kind of know ASL, they're trained on all 10 digits at the same time. Those that know nothing about ASL are sent down a different path where they're exposed to one digit after the other. We could ask them, or alternatively, we could automatically detect it. So as I already kind of mentioned, we could do a pretest. We could see, sort of show some digits and see how quickly, if at all, they sign those digits correctly. If they do, we send them down the advanced user path. Otherwise, we send them down the novice path. Okay, so that's just an example to show how to get over this sort of second hump of evaluation, which is how do we work backwards from numbers, or in this case, how do we work backwards from statistics to what aspects of our system we should, we should change. If we have users consistently scoring low on one part of your system, that's usually a clear signal about where things need to be improved. But if our statistics report a spread of interaction, that's more difficult. It shows that we are not supporting some subset of our user base, and it's often hard to know what that subset is and how to make our system more uh, inclusive. Okay, that concludes uh, lecture eight. We're gonna move on now to lecture nine and discuss uh, thinking about interactive systems as information spaces. Okay, so um, what is an inter information space? That word itself is a metaphor. It suggests that from the user's point of view when they're interacting with a system like a website, they of course see the two-dimensional screen of the current web page, but they somehow in their head project, uh, visualize that this is a 3D system, that the stuff that's behind the screen. You can see that when we talk about navigating web pages, right? Navigation means moving about, um, going further into a, web, a website. 
further in, that metaphor doesn't mean left, right, up and down on a web page. It means sort of this third dimension, which is not immediately obvious on the screen. So for any interactive system, your user knows consciously or unconsciously that they're looking at the tip of the iceberg and they're inferring aspects of the rest of the iceberg. What, what is in there? Okay, so depending on what subset of your system we expose to the user, that's going to influence the way that they think about your, your system. Right? Okay, so let's start with user interfaces, which is the most familiar aspect of information spaces. Uh, at the, the dawn of the computer age, there was only one user interface, which is you supplied punch cards to the machine, and a day or a week later, you got those cards back with your results. We're not going to talk about, uh, I'm not going to go that far back in history. With the advent of the personal computer, the original interfaces were text-based, command, command-based, right? There's a blinking cursor, and you could type, type things in. The exchange medium, the, way, the point at which the user came into contact with the information space, which is whatever this, the code was that was running on the computer, was the computer itself, the, the keyboard, and then slightly later, the mouse. Then the, uh, the WIMP revolution came along, which is uh, instead of looking at a screen where there was a bunch of text we could type in and see text in response that was returned to us by the computer, we didn't have to sort of, the computer was no longer a book or a magazine with text scrolling from top to bottom. It now was something else, something new, which was uh, a graphics-based interface, right? So WIMP stands for the fact that users would now see a, uh, one or more windows on the screen, these new things called icons, menus, pointers with the mouse. As you can imagine, this was a revolutionary idea at the time. And that basic way of interacting with computers is still mostly with us, at least for laptops and desktops. Right? Okay, so um, what are the assumptions under the different components of a WIMP interface? Well, the window, as the name itself implies, is a, is a view into something else. Right? We are looking through the window onto a subset of a larger landscape, which is the entire uh, is the, the software that we're interacting with. Okay, menus may provide a different view onto exactly the same system, right? You can navigate about on a website with a, with a cursor, or you can click on uh, a menu and, and navigate through the menu hierarchy. We talked about hierarchy when we talked about the tree map visualization last time. So there are pros and cons to, uh, to presenting information or available functions in a hierarchical way versus spreading them out over a two-dimensional surface. We talked about that last, last week. Widgets and icons are, are points, right? Zero-dimensional things. They are somewhere localized in space, and if we click on them and interact with those things at a particular time, they trigger certain uh, actions. Again, in WIMP interfaces, the point at which the software and the user meet is the computer itself. St still keyboard, still mouse. We're moving more and more, however, into uh, the exchange medium is the physical environment itself. We're touching uh, the screen. We're, we're moving away from the keyboard and mouse. We're touching the screen. In the case of the Leap Motion device, we're moving our hand in a wireless way through a three-dimensional through a three-dimensional volume of air over the device. We may not be touching the device itself. So the exchange medium, the point at which the user and the software meet is no longer necessarily the computer, it is something else. This volume of air over, over the device, moving into and out of a wired space as you move about your, your day. We're gonna talk about uh, ubiquitous computing in a few weeks where we're trying to embed computer technology in the world. So as people move about in the world um, and carry out their normal tasks, they are interacting with technology without stopping and typing something on a keyboard or touching something on a, on a screen. Okay, so those, uh, the cases where they're actually touching something, like touching a touch screen or touching a, a physical object, those are tangible interfaces. There's some tangible object that they're grasping or touching and manipulating. Okay, 
Here's a here's an, a kind of a fun example of a tangible interface. I'll play this demo in a moment. It's called the React table. Uh, you'll notice again in this case they are not interacting with the computer directly. They're going to be uh, reacting. Uh, they're going to be interacting with physical objects. This is a, um, a music application. You'll hear the music. So you'll notice that uh, in this application there are many visual metaphors to help the user understand how to interact with the React table. Because for most people, if you haven't seen the React table before, it's a non-intuitive interactive system. It's not obvious to see what functions are available and how to manipulate uh, how to manipulate the React table. As you'll see in the video, you can create music using the React table, but it's not a very familiar instrument. It doesn't look anything like a guitar or a keyboard, yet you can make music with it. How does the React table project affordances about how people can interact with the React table? They can react with it by physically manipulating tangible or physical objects. You'll notice that there are not only visual metaphors in the React table, but there are also some auditory metaphors. There are sounds that, that project affordances, that suggest how the system can be interacted. So I'm going to play this video. It's about two or three minutes long. While it's playing, I want you to quickly jot down any visual and or auditory metaphors you notice. What are the things that the system does to tell the user how the system can be used. Okay, off we go. Okay, not exactly my choice of music, but uh, fair enough. What are some of the what are some of the visual and auditory metaphors here? How does the React table advertise to the user how it can be used? What's the central metaphor? How does this system communicate how people create music with this? On a guitar, you strum strings. On a piano, you press keys. What's the main activity here for a React Table? How does, it, how does a user go about composing music with React Table?
Exactly. So adjusting physical objects on the board to control the software. This metaphor, you move and turn objects, right? So um, moving these objects or placing these objects onto the table or taking them off again and then rotating them when they're on the table, it's already a metaphor that is meant to be somewhat familiar. Obviously, this is unlike most musical instruments you've seen before, but it is trying to build conceptual consistency with another way of creating music. What is it? What is it particularly about moving, moving the objects or rotating the objects that should be familiar to most people that are interested in, in creating music? Soundboard knobs, right? Exactly. So for most people that are interested not just in music but electronic music, which this is, there should be a lot of features of the React table that are somewhat familiar. What is the affordance uh, when you turn when you turn one of these objects, you rotate it on the table, it has an impact, or when you move these objects around the table, the React table reacts. What is the reaction? of the React table, and what is the React table trying to tell the user by, do, by doing so? So there is visual and auditory feedback. That is the way in which it communicates how it's reacting to what the user did. But what is, what, is that, what is that reaction in particular? Let's maybe focus on just moving the objects. When, Pete, when the user was adding uh, objects and then moving them about on the table, what happened? You might have noticed that uh, if they moved one of the blocks, uh, it added, as Prasida mentions, it added lines between the objects. Um, what were those lines, what did those lines mean? So that was the reaction, that was the visual feedback, as Ryan mentioned. It would draw lines between objects. It would connect close objects, exactly. So if two objects were apart, they were not connected by a line, but if they brought close enough, suddenly a line would be formed between them. What is the affordance here? What is React Table trying to tell the user about what's happening when they bring two objects close to one another, or if they brought one of the objects close towards the center of the React Table? A tree stump affords the interaction of uh, sitting on it. Those connected lines affords what verb? What, what does it allow the user to do? A combination of sounds. It allows the user to m make combinations of sounds. There's the, the verb, right? To, to make or create. If you go back and watch the video, that, that the way the combination is very specific and it's different for different kinds of blocks you can put on the, you can put on the, the table. If any of the blocks connect to the center, you actually see that the line starts to pulse or there's flow of something from the block towards the center of the screen. That is that particular block adding its particular contribution to the overall uh, sound being produced by the React table. So the central metaphor of the system is the source sync uh, system. So sync if you turn on the sink in your kitchen sink, all the water flows down to one point, the basin of, of attraction, right? So all of the contributions of objects are trying to flow towards the central node, and that central node is where everything is combined and the music is projected back to, to the user. Uh, obviously, the React table was flat, so it's not curved. It's not, there isn't stuff that is literally flowing down. It is metaphorically flowing towards the center, and things that are further away, they do their thing. They connect to something that is closer towards the center of the table. That more centrally located object combines or is modulated by or is uh, modified by whatever is flowing from the further away object, and that in turn goes to the center. Uh, and so on. So the React table, if you go back and watch the video, it is very rich in a lot of these different metaphors and there's a lot of 
visual and auditory stuff going on to support this central metaphor of uh, uh, sources flowing, multiple sources flowing down to a central sink. Okay, so uh, that's, that's just one example of a tangible uh, interface. Let's go back to GUIs or WIMP interfaces for a moment. Obviously, uh, uh, GUIs themselves uh, were designed to present visual metaphors, which is sheets of paper that are distributed across a surface. Um, hope, luckily, my desk doesn't look like this, but it definitely was approaching looking like this before the pandemic hit. Some people have messier, cleaner desktops. The desktop, the word itself, is meant to support a particular metaphor. There were uh, some not so successful attempts to try and break the desktop out of two dimensions and create 3D views onto, uh, onto your desktop. They weren't very successful, probably because it didn't really support activities that people were trying to carry out on their desktop on their, their computer. I think in the interest of time, I'll skip over showing you the bump top demo, but it is definitely worth going and watching. Uh, in the bump top demo, they combined uh, graphics with a physics engine. So a physics engine, uh, as the name implies, gives physical properties to objects in the virtual world. For example, uh, each of the uh, files or the icons that you can see here have their own uh, geometric extent, length, width, and height. They're basically a small box sitting on top of the bump top table. They have their own mass. Uh, some of these objects are heavier than others. Um, they also uh, have their own friction properties. So if you click on one of these, uh, rec uh, one of these, um, actually, I think I'm basically describing the video. So let's let's just watch the video for a moment. Okay, it's not immediately obvious from this particular video, uh, from this particular video, that these things actually have mass. There's a, a, an older video of Bump Top where they grab them and sort of throw them against the wall, and they stick to the wall. Uh, Orion thinks this is pretty neat. Some people think it's maybe not so neat. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of eye candy here. It looks visually engaging, so maybe this is a fun way to interact with your uh, desktop. But does it actually help with the activities that people want to carry out with their desktop, like arranging icons or collecting files together? Possibly. It's pretty intuitive. You sort of lasso and pull uh, objects together. You can stack them. You can see there's a vertical stack here in the bump top. Uh, you can push them into a corner. So maybe I throw all my images in the top left corner, all my spreadsheets in the top right, Word documents, bottom right, so on. Perhaps, perhaps. Okay. Another example of how it's easy to sort of run away with what's possible in a, in a physics-based desktop than it is with what it, what it, whether it actually serves a purpose. It may be that, as Ryan mentions, people find it pretty neat, but once the novelty wears off, they, they prefer to go back to boring 2D displays. We could measure that in some user testing with a bump top prototype uh, and so on. Okay, David uh, Matthews mentions a number of the interactions remind me of Google and Apple Maps, possibly. So the bump top is actually something that was uh, that was presented quite a quite a few years ago. It might have inspired some of the developers of Google and Apple Maps. I'm not sure. Okay, so the basic takeaway of the last few slides here is that different uh, interface objects reflect different underlying organizational themes. So what is an interface object? Those are the building blocks of any inter interactive system. So in a GUI, interface objects are windows, menus, um, pop-ups, buttons, and so on. In your system so far, the interface objects are um, 
Uh, well, at the moment, it's only virtual bones, right? Virtual hands, virtual bones. You might add some additional interface objects in a little while. Windows are meant to support the fact that humans are very v visual creatures and we respond quickly to spatial organization. We like to spread things out, move everything over here, all spreadsheets over here, all Word documents over here. We can look at something and very quickly get a global view of the overall structure of that system. So there are advantages to showing things distributed over a two-dimensional surface. Humans, however, also like to think hierarchically. So I probably couldn't get you to recite um, the title of every lecture we've had so far, but maybe some of you would be able to remember the three or four major themes in the course. And then for each of those themes, I could ask you, tell me an example of something we talked about under that theme. You could probably do so. I'm trying to guide you in your thinking to think hierarchically and give you a better way of absorbing the overall structure of this of this course. Command-based interfaces where we type one thing after another. Uh, if you're an advanced uh, Linux user, you might know about piping where you type a command and whatever the result of that command is, you immediately pipe it to another uh, command and, and you can very quickly uh, put things together in very complex sequences and tell your computer to do this, then this, then this, then this, then this. List all the files, pull out all the spreadsheets, move them into that directory and, send, and email them to my friend. So sometimes, depending on what we want to do, we want to organize things sequentially. Sometimes um, there are rare events or important events that happen in the midst of us doing something else, and we'd like our system to remind us of those events. This one is clearly very controversial because with all the constellation of technologies around us on our phones and, uh, and our computers all day, there is increasingly more interruptions from pop-ups and contextual organization, last minute emails from UVM about changes to the pandemic rules. All of us are having to deal with increasingly more uh, interruptions during the day. A few is useful. I'm gonna work on this, but when this important task happens, let me know, because this is very important. There's a use to that, but too much of that is no longer acceptable. Right. Okay, so all of these different interface objects that we're very familiar with, they are responding to particular aspects of human cognition, ways that we think and ways that we like to think. Okay, I think we'll stop there for uh, today. Um, you have a quiz due tonight. Um, I have a two hour meeting that's starting right now, so I won't be able to post the quiz or the video lecture until maybe about two o'clock or three o'clock this afternoon. My apologies for that. If that causes you a problem, just email me and we can try and make, uh, make arrangements. Otherwise, I hope you have a good rest of your Tuesday and we'll see you all back here Thursday morning. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye-bye.